Thank you for joining us this evening. It's a splendid day at Dominican University of California because we have some very special guests who've made a huge difference in our world, and it's a really a terrific opportunity, isn't it, to have them here in Marin County. So I want to thank you for joining us and for them for also coming tonight. So my name is Denise Lucy. I'm the professor of business leadership and the director of the Institute for Leadership Studies. This program is a partnership with Book Passage and the Institute, and this has been our eighth year of supporting dialogues with our community. And we also have our students in the hall tonight. May I hear from my students? Are you here? Oh, come on. There, there you go. That's a little better. We have some business majors tonight. The Institute for Leadership Studies is a leadership development center, and our lecture series seeks to promote leadership ideas and engage with the community around those ideas. And what better opportunity than to have uh, Governor Granholm here to talk about the, the, uh, this is a really important topic, certainly to all of us. Our lecture series really seeks to feature more than business. It seeks to look around the, across the disciplines, featuring world politics, literature, psychology, civil rights, government, entertainment. And many of you, I'm certain, have been here before. And, I, and for those of you who are new, I hope you will return for future events. Tonight's lecture is special. As a Michigander myself, I'm thrilled that we have the governor, Governor Groundholm here, joined by Dan Mulhern, who co-authored the book, A Governor's Story, The Fight for Jobs and America's Economic Future. And it, what's really interesting to me is that, you know, historically, since 1925, only 35 women have served as governors. And today, in 2012, six women serve as governors, 66% of whom are Republicans. So we have too few women, don't you think? In, in the State House. And it's so thrilling, thrilling to have one of, the, one of the main women leaders in our country here tonight. Our sponsor, I mean our, our series is supported by sponsors and this entire academic year we have the wonderful support of Private Ocean Wealth Management. It's one of the oldest and largest privately held wealth management firms in Marin and thank you to the CEO and founder Richard Stone I know he's here tonight. Thank you, Richard, for your ongoing support for this entire lecture, the entire year. We can't thank you enough for the 13 total programs that you're helping us support this year. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Tonight's program is brought to you by our platinum sponsor, Circle Bank, who has been repeatedly supportive of us in supporting the lecture series. Our silver sponsor is the Women's Leadership and Philanthropy Council, again, a very consistent supporter, and Marin's Women's Commission, another great, great return supporter. So thank you all. Please thank them all. In fact, last, last week, we, we actually record these, video, these lectures on video, and last week we had our 100,000th viewer on YouTube. So please tell your, your friends and, and, and family to watch our, our lectures after the, the live events. We also record them for podcast on our Peglin Radio and also on uh, Community Media Center of Marin on Channel 26. We will also air many of the, of the lectures. I want to thank the students who are here this evening who volunteered their time, the staff and students. May we thank them for giving up their Sunday evening to help greet you. Thank you very much. To introduce our speaker is Kim Castellonis, the CEO of Circle Bank, our platinum supporter tonight. Kim is a model of organizational and community leadership, and it is an honor to have her join us this evening. Kim became the chair, uh, chairman and CEO of Circle Bank in 1996, and in the intervening years, she has led the community bank to a leadership position among Northern California financial institutions. Kim is one of the few CEO, female CEOs in a, of a multi-branch community bank in our country. Circle Bank is the only North Bay quartered community bank with full service branch in San Francisco and under her leadership, Circle Bank has recorded over 48 great profitable quarters and it's great to have a community bank like Circle Bank in our community who support programs like this. Please welcome Kim Castellonis.
Good evening. So happy to have you all with us here this evening. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce two outstanding leaders. Ladies first. Former governor of the state of Michigan, Jennifer M. Granhold, is one of the most respected political figures in the country. She served two terms as governor and was the state's first female attorney general. And as a female banker in an all-male industry, that really works for me. As governor, Granholm led the state through a brutal economic downturn that resulted from the meltdown in the automotive and manufacturing sectors. She worked to diversify the state's economy and bring jobs to Michigan by adding emerging industries such as green energy, clean energy to Michigan's economic portfolio. While Ms. Granholm was governor, Michigan was repeatedly named one of the top three states in the nation for business locations or expansion and was twice recognized by the Pew Center on the States as one of the best managed states in the nation. According to the Gallup Job Creation Index, Michigan led the country in the improvement of job market conditions during her tenure. Her book, A Governor's Story, the Fight for Jobs in America's Economic Future, which she co-wrote with her husband, Dan Mulhern, is a Washington Post political bestseller. Ms. Granholm cur currently teaches courses in law and public policy at the University of California, Berkeley, where she received her undergraduate degree and is the host of the current TV's national political talk show, The War Room with Jennifer Granholm, which airs weeknights on current TV. Taking a quote from her Facebook page, Lead sometimes leadership is planting trees under whose shade you may never sit. Ms. Granholm is clearly one of those rare people that when someone says to you, you can't do it, you just point to her and say, she does. Joining her this evening in conversation is her husband, Dan Mulhern a nationally recognized expert in the field of leadership, gender, and organizational culture. Now teaching courses at UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business and Bolt Law School, Mulhern leverages his experience to offer valuable insight on cultural changes happening in today's workplaces. In addition to co-authoring A Governor's Story, Mr. Mulhern's published two books on leadership, Everyday Leadership, Getting Results in Business, Politics, and Life, and Be Real, inspiring stories for leading at home and at work. He has been writing and distributing his acclaimed blog, Reading for Leading, to a list of more than 10,000 readers for just over 12 years. Please join me in welcoming the dynamic duo, Jennifer Granholm and her husband, Dan Mulhern. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Anybody interested in a little 2012 presidential discussion tonight? Because <laughs> uh, this is a book that's really extremely relevant, I think, for that topic. And, and so I'm sure we'll come there, and maybe some of your questions will have to do with that. Uh, Jennifer took office in 2002. She was elected and took office January 1, 2003, in the state of Michigan. It was an incredibly jubilant, exciting time for our family, for our team, uh, for the state, really, to have elected a, a, a first female governor and somebody who had been a very popular attorney general. Hopes were extremely high. And uh, why don't you take it from there? <laughs> Well, in fact, you know, when you're a governor, every January, and it's true here in California too, the economists are brought to the state capitol to tell the governor what the economy of the state's going to be like so you can base your budget on what the prognostication is. And so in January of 2003, everybody said, we are just coming out of a national recession, but by the fourth quarter of 2003, jobs will be coming into the state. You will be looking, you'll be able to take credit for coming in in the valley and turning the economy around. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. In fact, at the end of my first year, I get a call from the head, I'm gonna stand up, 
because I, I can't Knock tell yourself. this story without having you feel it. So I get a call from the guy who is the vice president for the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. It's our statewide economic development agency. And he says, Governor, we have a major problem. And I said, well, what is it? He said, we have a crisis in Greenville. Greenville, now I don't know how many of you are from Michigan or know Michigan, but you know, in Michigan we carry our map on the bottom of our arm. This is the lower peninsula, upper peninsula. Anyway, Greenville is sort of right in the middle of the state. Town of 8,000 people, tiny town. And he says, Greenville is about to lose its major employer. That employer is a refrigerator factory. It's owned by Electrolux. In fact, the refrigerator factory has been in Greenville for 100 years. And I said, well, remind me, how many people live in Greenville? He says, 8,000. And I said, well, how many people work at the refrigerator factory? He says, 2,700. So 2,700 in a town of 8,000? This town grew up around making refrigerators. It, and I, so I said, new governor, we are not going to have this loss on my watch. We're going to go to Greenville, and we are going to do everything we can to make them an offer they can't refuse so that they stay in Michigan. So we did. Brought all of the resources that the state had to bear on this. We, in fact, we met in Greenville with the management of Electrolux, but we were in the city hall, little city hall, but a big room. And we had the mayor there, and the city manager was there, and the head of the workforce was there, and the guy who ran the community college was there, and the chamber of commerce was there. Everybody was there. And so we had this huddle about what we were going to offer to Electrolux to keep them in Greenville. And so, you know, we shook out our pockets, and we put on the table, the state did zero taxes for 20 years. And we said, we will help to build you a new factory. And the workers put $20 million in concessions per year on the table. And the, the community college said, we'll train the workforce. We'll do whatever it takes. So we you know, stacked up our incentives, and we pushed our pile of incentives across the table to the management of Electrolux. And they took our list, and they went outside the room, and they stayed outside for 17 minutes. And they came back in, and they said, wow, this is the most generous offer we have ever been given. It's amazing. <clears throat> but there's nothing you can do to compensate for the fact that we can pay $1.57 an hour in Juarez, Mexico. So they moved. And in fact, um, I was so... This was just a huge defeat. It was like a nuclear bomb went off in this little town, as you can imagine. And I was so, I was so wrenched by it. What? Distraught. Distraught. <laughs> Very distraught by it. And in fact, every year, all of the governors have a meeting in Washington, D.C. And so this meeting happened, like the decision was made in January of 2004. And we had our meeting of all the governors in Washington, D.C. And the guy who was the head of the Democratic governors at the time is a guy named Gary Locke. He's now the ambassador to China. He was head of the U.S. Department of Commerce. And he was sort of my mentor as I was coming in as a brand new governor. And so he was hosting this big event with all the sponsors there and everything. And all the governors were supposed to stand up before the sponsors and tell them the great things they had done in their first year in office, because we were all just sort of after our first year. And so everybody gets up. Janet Napolitano, she was the governor of Arizona. She gets up and talks about this, what they're doing in kindergarten. And Kathleen Sebelius, who was the governor of Kansas at the time, she gets up and brags about what they're doing in Kansas. And I get up, and I'm stuck on Electrolux. And so I tell them the story of Electrolux. And the, you know, all the sponsors and the people who support, they're all there. <laughs> and Gary Locke says, well, Governor Granholm, come over here. And next, Governor, please. And uh, he says, uh, next time I tell you to get up and talk about one of your successes, really, maybe you should talk about one of your successes and not one of your failures. But then he says, this is a terrible story for America. Well, turns out, the month that the last refrigerator came off of the assembly line in Greenville, Michigan, the employees had a gathering 
that they had at Clackle's Orchard Pavilion and the gathering they called the Last Supper. It was a big picnic, essentially, and, um, and I went to it. I wasn't announced or anything. I just felt like I wanted to go because I knew what this community was experiencing. And I went in to Clackle's Orchard Pavilion and all of these just thousand people were in this pavilion, all clustered around eight top tables, eating out of box lunches. There was a sad band playing, or a band playing sad songs. I can't figure out which. Um, and I went up to the first table, and this, the, the, one of the fellows who was at the table stands up, and he says, um, Governor Granholm, um, I want you to meet my two daughters. They were like teenagers. And he had tattoos, and he had his baseball cap on backwards, and he says, I am 48 years old. He said, I went from high school to factory. I've worked at this factory for 30 years. My father worked here. My grandfather worked here. All I know, he said, is how to make refrigerators. And then he looked at his daughters, and he put his hand on his chest, and he says to me, so, Governor, tell me, who is ever going to hire me? Who is ever going to hire me? That cry was not just from this guy or the others who lined up to tell me their story that day. That's really the cry of workers all across America who have seen the structural change to our nation's economy. It wasn't just Greenville. Okay, so I'm going to pick up there, but before I get to the... Be uh, happier, will you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're... <laughs> happy book we're selling here. Um, before I talk about the economics and the public policy issues that Jennifer has just foreshadowed, since this is the Institute of Leadership Studies and many of you are leading in one place or another and many of these students want to lead, I'm just curious, what did you hear in that story as far as leadership practices? Was there anything that the governor did that you'd say, yeah, it was pretty good, good idea, fits with the textbook, yeah. Yeah, good. So she listened. There's a field of work, MBWA, management by walking around. And, and it, it, it keeps people in big, mighty positions in touch with people. Wonderful example. What else? Hey, hang on. What was it? Unbelievable frustration. Unbelievable frustration. What's the connection to leadership, sir? Uh, the fact that it goes with the territory. Oh, that it goes with the territory. So some part of leadership is dealing with the fact that you're going to have some major frustration and things you can't deal with. And I heard somebody else say empathy, and, and, and that was a piece of it. I know you're studying um, uh, emotional intelligence, and so if you're reading your Daniel Goleman, you know that there's issues of self-awareness. Right? Aren't there students here who are studying that? Oh, yeah, there, yes? there are, I think I see them in here. Where are y'all? Anything else? You were saying something, sir. That she cared about, about something. That she cared about people. Something else? Yes, sir. Ma'am, sorry. Oh, boy, that's a, that's a biggie. Did you hear that? She said, not being afraid to tell people the sad truth when they want to hear happy stories. That's a big, big theme in the book, is how do you get elected and how do you uh, maintain power when there's some really big forces at loose that I'm going to come right back to. One more thing. Yes, back there. I can't see with the lights. Yeah. She went to the source of the problem, did you say? Right, rather than... Yeah, great, great. So uh, it was a very collaborative thing. There was no technical solution. It wasn't like she could open the economic development cabinet uh, in her office and click a switch and the jobs would be there. It was really a need to collaborate and bring lots of people together and see how do we work on the problem. So I think it was a good piece. Hey, great work. Okay, so it, that's important because we're all going to face a much bigger issue, and you'll see it as uh, this talk unfolds and we talk about the relevance. So let me talk about the relevance for a minute. What Jennifer said is it wasn't only happening in Michigan. It felt like it was, right, to us in many respects. Michigan led the league, uh, as her opponent would say in 2006, were uh, first 
in the things we should be last in, like unemployment rate. And Michigan was the worst. It was the canary in the coal mine. But the fact is that the recession that really hit the country in 2008 and was continuing to hit us, that recession was caused by some really, really deep forces. And those forces are at play right now. And they ought to be the focus of a 2012 election, which is why I started us that way. So in the period of 2000 to 2010, when we saw the unemployment rate, especially late in the decade, rise to nearly 10% in this country, you would think that we were losing jobs and that our corporations were really suffering, right? But in that decade, you would have been right. We lost uh, American manufacturing companies, eliminated 2.5 million jobs here in this country. They closed 42,000 factories were closed during that time for the reason Jennifer said. And we heard this audible groan, $1.57 in Juarez. And you could hear people in the front row go, ah. Oh. So, but here's the trick. During that same 10-year period, those same corporations, those American corporations doing business abroad, grew 2.9 million jobs abroad. So they had a net increase of 400,000 jobs. Only here, we lost 2.5 million jobs. Now, that's a complicated picture. Um, it's, uh, some Democrats might get on a high horse and say, why are they abandoning us? But most of those companies, probably nearly all of them, were facing somebody else they were competing with, who was taking their factory to Singapore, to Taiwan, to uh, Mexico, to Brazil. And in order to simply stay in business, they had to do it. We're in a global economy, right? That's the bottom line. Um, how many of you read Thomas Friedman's book when it came out in 2005? Probably his most important book, The World is Flat. Did any, anybody here read it? Uh, it? It should be required reading for every high school student and for every college student in America. It should be required reading for every voter. And what Friedman argues is basically that the world has become flat again, and that all you need is a little computer hookup on a dirt floor somewhere in India, and you can compete with anybody else. Uh, Robert Reich has argued this extremely well uh, in addition. And one thing that just jumped out at me in that book was when he wrote in 2004 that there were, uh, I think at the time it was 150,000 United States tax returns had been prepared and processed from India. And he was predicting that in 2005, that number was going to jump to a quarter million. And you don't, it doesn't it hit you, you feel like, well, this is like as American as it could get, isn't it? I mean, preparing American tax returns. I mean. Don't we need to do that, and don't we need to know that? And yet, Friedman's point was, no, you don't. You can do a 1040 online, and you can figure out what you need to figure out, and you've got a good accountant uh, who's climbing his way up or her way up in Brazil or India, and they can do it. So I was curious to update it, and so I looked a couple months ago, where do we stand now? I couldn't find a global number you know, of all of the firms. I'm not sure everybody wants to publish that. It's so deeply disturbing. But I did find that Ernst & Young alone did a million returns last year in India. So the growth is continuing, and it's phenomenal. And the point I make as I turn it over back to Jennifer is this, that we are in an economy that is no longer a closed economy. Uh, of the United States, where you can affect our tax policy or our training policy or any other policy and think that that alone will not impact things. We are competing with the globe. And so the situation we have to come to grips with is how do we deal with that? And how are we going to deal with that fact? And how are we going to compete with that $1.57 wages? So Jennifer didn't have that whole story. She'll go back to 2003. Friedman's book is about to come out. And I ask you, OK, Electrolux falls apart. You couldn't put it back together. So what did you do? Well, wait, 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 wait. But first, I mean, think about what all of the talking heads out there, the politicians and others, say are, are the prescriptions for creating jobs in America. What do they say? Tax cuts, tax cuts of course. 
tax cuts are what are what the whole thing has been based on for so long. And I tried that in my first term, not just with Electrolux, we were offered zero taxes, zero taxes for 20 years, zero. Um, but I also cut taxes in my first term 99 times, 99 times. In fact, um, by the time I left office, because of the changes to our economy uh, and all, all of the other stuff that was going on in Michigan, I had cut taxes and the size of government, the size of Michigan's government, more than any other state in the country, by far, by far. More employees, more shrink, 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 shrink. We didn't have a state fair. We, didn't, we shrunk. So you would think that if smaller government and lower taxes were the prescription for job creation, that Michigan would have had the most robust economy in the nation. Right? If those were the only things. Of course you have to have a competitive tax climate. And I'm not saying that. But if those are your main ball of wax, and other countries are not just providing you tax incentives, but they're giving you a handshake on access to capital. They are assembling land for your factory. You can pay a buck an hour or whatever it is. You're up against it, folks. And so I, as governor, as Dan knows, I mean, I came out to California, to Silicon Valley, and I said, I would say, all the governors do this. We always poach, right? We go from state to state trying to suck up jobs from somebody else. And so I came to Silicon Valley, and I said to all these great entrepreneurs, listen, you guys have great ideas. I know you're not going to manufacture in California, but if you want to take your idea to scale, come to Michigan. We'll give you an offer you can't refuse. I would do the same, I'd go to Texas, I'd go to Ohio, you name it. And in fact, Michigan was always in the top one, two, or three states in the country in terms of poaching, because I was so aggressive about it. Now, what a crappy US economic development strategy that is, right? Because all we're doing is moving jobs around from one state to another, and as every governor throws incentives on the pile, you know, it's just chasing this spiral downward, right? That's what, that's what we're all doing because that's all we've got. And every governor, of course, we go to these governor's meetings and we're like, I got that one from you. I got that company to come to Michigan. It's crazy. And I tell you this now in retrospect, it's totally crazy. And, and so I did all of that, but what worked was not that. In fact, Michigan has, in the past two years, had the strongest rebound of any state in the country. The strongest rebound. Why? It wasn't because I cut taxes and because the government shrunk. It was because there was a decision made to have a strategic investment to not just save the auto industry, but to invest in sectors that Michigan could be competitive in, in public-private partnerships. I say this because every other country is doing this. In fact, I'll, I'll just, I mean, I did a whole, sw I, I would love to talk to you about the SWOT analysis and everything, and maybe we can go back and forth on this, babe. But um, I was in China last year and um, was visiting with a number of companies that are doing clean energy, and they wanted to show us what China was doing. And I was, you know, my hair was standing on end because of all of the stuff that China is doing to be able to, you know, get that investment. And um, in one of the meetings, one of the officials says to me, so when do you think the United States is going to get a national energy policy? And I said, oh my God, you know, Congress, divisiveness, blah, blah. And he said, I said, I, I think it's going to be a long time, at least with the current configuration in Washington. And um, he said, <laughs> he said, take your time. <laughs> because they see our passivity as their opportunity. So I was moderating a CEO roundtable of um, executives from uh, Coca-Cola, the, the CEOs of Coca-Cola, John Deere, AT&T, a number of CEOs who do business all around the world. And the subject of the panel was, what should be the role of government in creating jobs in America in a global economy? And so I said to these CEOs, I said, you guys do business everywhere. Who does it best? What is the country we should be looking at? Anybody know what they would say? Not China. Who said Singapore? 
Singapore. Why? Singapore is all over it. They're all over it. Uh, yes, it's true. You know, we're not, we don't want to copy the form of government, but their economic development strategy is, it is huge. And CEOs everywhere will tell you that they have it the best. It is a professional operation. They've done an analysis on their entire country to determine where their strengths and weaknesses are. They've decided what sectors make sense for them geographically and given their history. And then they have specific targets of going after foreign direct investment and bringing that to Singapore. And so they will provide access to capital, low interest loans, so that factories can come and get in the ground. That access to capital is critical. They will provide a, a cluster of businesses that can do business with one another. They are very focused. Now what do we do in the United States? Nothing. We don't even, we don't do any of that. And in the meantime, we are accomplices to the continual loss of jobs here without an active, strategic, focused government centered on economic development. All right. Right? I'm just saying, hands off is not going to work. So, Mr. Leadership, let me ask you a question. Oh, go for it, yeah. <laughs> so what, from your, I mean, obviously you had a ringside seat to the challenges in Michigan. And um, from your perspective, on the leadership side, what do you think are the most important lessons that people can learn from leading during really hard times? Yeah. Um, well, let me talk about the economics, just to add a little piece to what you were saying. And then... Uh, and then go from there. And from the economic standpoint, what's really challenging, I think, is um, the classic notion that makes so much sense that comes from a free market economy. And that really is, uh, Jennifer's made this point a, a little bit already, that it makes so much sense to cut taxes and have as low a level of regulation as you can to let the market work. Let people's creativity work. Let it drive to create jobs and to create businesses. But the biggest part of the problem is that our system is not closed anymore. Jack Welch, who was uh, practically worshipped as the CEO of General Electric um, in his tenure through uh, the 90s and, and probably retired in 2002 or 2003 or so. But Welch at one point said, really from from a commercial standpoint, an economic standpoint, as the CEO, what would be the best situation is if you could put your plants on a boat and you could move them to where currency uh, rates and where labor rates are best. That was the sense. Um, in Jennifer's situation, Electrolux was a refrigerator company. And oddly, if you think about it, um, you'd think, well, Michigan is autos, right? Isn't that what Michigan is, is cars? But really, Michigan's cars came out of building um, carriages. And we were good at shaping metal. And it wasn't that far to shape a refrigerator. It wasn't a lot different than bending metal for a car. And so you had companies like Whirlpool, which is still in, uh, down here by Chicago, um, in Michigan, and Frigidaire. But then a Swedish company comes along and says, you know what, uh, we think there's money to be made here. Let's take hold of this company. And what interest did Sweden have in, in, uh, in Greenville, in Greenville, Michigan? Why, why would they care, right? I mean, and, and you get a, a strange kind of irony where people like Jennifer and me, who are Democrats, think of ourselves as caring about the working person. And a good Republican capitalist could come along and say, Really, it's better to have those jobs in Juarez. We're sorry about those people listening to the sad band play sad music in Greenville. But there's people starving in Mexico, you know, living on subsistence wages. Bully for them that they're getting good jobs and, you know, in the long run, things will rise. But that creates an enormous problem for us and one that I want to get you thinking about and then Jennifer and I will ask you, what do you think is the national prescriptive strategy? How do you compete with the groans 
of jobs going to Juarez, Mexico for $1.57. How do we compete with that? And not just factory jobs, but call center jobs. You, all, you guys have all called, right, uh, for your phone problem, your utility problem, your very local problem, and you're not talking to somebody in the East Bay or somebody, you know, in, uh, in Richmond where they could use some economic development. You're talking to somebody in, in India who's telling you his name is, is Sam. And you're thinking, I'm not sure his name is really Sam. Um, so how do we compete with that? We want to ask you that question and, and what you think is the answer, because that is what this national election is going to be about, our, our two models. Just, you're itching. Jump I, in. I, I, just, just to, before you finish that, just two facts or two things to think about as you think about how the U.S. can compete. One is that 2003 there was a lot of companies doing this labor arbitrage, but that's a little bit less today because advanced manufacturing means that there is much less labor involved in the stuff that you, that you buy. Um, in a car, labor is only 7% of the cost of the vehicle. So there's a slight opportunity there for us as a country. And the second fact is this, and it goes to the other side of things, which is that these other countries are so aggressive. Vice, uh, excuse me, President Bush, in his um, biography, Decision Points, had a conversation with Hu Jintao. And like he did with all leaders, he asked Hu Jintao. Prime Minister of China. Huh? The Prime Minister. The, pre of the, Prime China. Minister, the President of China, excuse me. And like he did with all leaders, he asked them, What keeps you up at night? Sort of a conversation starter. And, um, and for, for President Bush, of course, what kept him up at night is the threat of terrorism. And what Hu Jintao said is, What keeps him up at night? is creating 25 million jobs a year for my people. We need to be having that mindset with everybody you elect to office. What keeps you up at night? How do we create jobs in America in a global economy? All right. So I don't want Jennifer to make you think that it's easy, so I'm going to make it hard again <laughs> and say that when you have advanced manufacturing, you don't have a lot of jobs by definition. So when I was a kid and I went on tours of Ford factories, uh, they were like the old pictures you've seen in the Charlie Chapman mo movies. You know, one guy couldn't move without hitting another guy on the factory line. If we took, took you to a Ford or a Toyota or a Nissan plant, we'd rather take you to a Ford plant, <laughs> especially here in Northern California. Uh, you would see vast stretches where robots and lines are moving themselves. And so it's a different kind of job, and it's less job. So this is, again, part of the problem that I want to come back to you on. Um, but here's the leadership point that I want to make, because Jennifer was asking me, what do you think about it in terms of leadership? And there's a classic kind of case that used to be taught in the business schools uh, probably 30 years ago, and it was all about railroads and how railroads were the most powerful, growth-oriented companies in America. They were just going great guns, and they were the Microsofts and the Googles and the Apples of their time. But then they didn't realize that what was happening, cars, right? They didn't realize that transportation was becoming a different thing. There were other ways. There were cars and buses and soon planes to get around the country. They weren't the only game in town. So you look at Blockbuster Video, right? It's the same situation, right? I mean, great guns store on every corner, but now who needs a, a VCR? I mean, they switched to, to DVDs for a while, but, but those are gone, right? If you're in the newspaper business, you've got to be saying to yourself, you know, newspaper, we've got a problem here because we think of ourselves as a newspaper. We, we are in love with the ink and the factory and the tangible feel. And guess what? Our kids aren't. You're in the TV business. You know, most of these kids don't have TVs anymore. Probably the youngsters in the room don't. They watch on their computer and they watch TiVo and they watch what they want when they want. So America is in the midst of that. And so I want to ask uh, our students here or our business leaders here or our uh, I, I liked or our moms and grandmas. I was saying to somebody the other day, I was talking to Maria Shriver this week, and I was 
I was saying, Maria. Just dropped names. Just dropping names, yeah. <laughs> so, um, the all, all, let me just we say, were first ladies yeah, together. Yeah, all of the first ladies, they're very close. You can get us started on that whole conversation. But I said to Maria, I think the leadership field has so much to teach us about home, about how to motivate our aging parents or how to deal with our kids. And I said, if you think about adolescence, it's change management. There's a ton written, right? You guys have read your, your John Cotter, I understand, on change management. Well, what is adolescence but going from a dependent child to an adult? It's a major process of change management. So you moms who've done change management, right, who've realized, boy, these practices that we're working with an 8-year-old are not working on the 15-year-old anymore. You know, maybe I need to do something different. Or those of you who've studied, what do you think the country ought to focus on? theoretically, or in a leadership, uh, you know, in leadership theory, or in a practical way, when we had a manufacturing sector, and we had lots of jobs that people could walk right out of high school, or even quit high school for, or do a year of college, what does change management tell you about what we need to do as a country, when now we're competing with billions of workers who are willing to work for a buck fifty-seven an hour, or work did, did anybody read the story about Apple, an extraordinary story in the New York Times about Apple coming out with their iPad and <clears throat> manufacturing it in China, and how uh, Steve Jobs didn't like the glass that was going to be on the iPad, and he said, we're not going with this. It doesn't work. And they changed all the specs, and they said, we need it. And they said, okay, Steve, cool, but this is going to take us like six months. And he said, no, no, we're on the same timetable, two months. And so at Foxconn, this big, huge, huge corporation in China, they just said to the factory workers who live in housing provided by Foxconn, y'all are working 12-hour days, six days a week till we get it done. And it happened, right? Okay, so we don't want to do that, right? That's not where we want to go. We don't want to race to the bottom. So what do we do, you guys? I gotta move up so I can see. Yes, sir. Education. Education. <laughs> Train people to do what we're good at. Innovation, not manufacturing, not old style putting uh, nuts on bolts. Yes, sir. Creativity. Creativity. What does that mean? Okay. 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 He's saying creativity. Uh, don't keep everybody in the office, but get people out there, mixing it up in the world, stirring things up, finding new ways to do things. Um, is that what they do in change management, by the way? Is that what Blockbuster did or should have done? Is that what the railroads should have done? Is that what higher ed should do? Yeah, hang on to the taxation point. Is that, you guys? Who knows anything about change management? Come on, you guys do, I know. You, I see all the Cotter readers there in the middle. Yes, Denise? You need to create a sense of urgency. Create a sense of urgency. There is no sense of urgency. Do you want to tell them about the, you were fit to be tied when we were looking for a cottage in Michigan. Ah, <laughs> yes, remind me of that story. So yeah, we're looking for a cottage in Michigan and um, the, the realtor that we were working with was married to the superintendent of schools in this rural area. This is two years ago, right? Two year, a year, a year ago. A year ago. So not at the beginning of your term. It was one year ago. After we had gone through all of this stuff in Michigan, after we'd been talking, because we were blue in the face about education for that very reason, so I said to the realtor, I said, so how, how are things going in this district? And she said, well, my husband's really, he's really depressed. I said, why? What's going on? She said, the, they're just not, they're not meeting the new standards because we put in place a statewide, you know, statewide standards that had every child taking a college prep curriculum. And I said, well, why, what's the problem? She said, it's the parents. I said, well, what's the problem with the parents? She said, they think the jobs are coming back those same jobs. 
and that the kids will be able to go from high school to factory in the same way that guy in Greenville was. I was like, and, and I mean, if you hadn't been through, if you had lived in Michigan for the past decade, if you weren't, if fire wasn't underneath you knowing that we had to change and there was a sense of urgency about it because you knew every one of your neighbors had a job in one of those factories that was now gone. So yes, you have to have a sense of urgency in order to make the changes that are otherwise very difficult to make. You have to be able to over communicate it by a factor of 10, right? But sometimes even you have to over communicate it by a factor of a thousand. You have to be relentless about it because change is really hard for people. And so when we put in these new standards in Michigan, all the local, I mean, you guys have done this now too. We did this in 2005 in Michigan where all of the local school districts, of course, wanted to have their local control and local control was very, very important. But in Michigan, we only had one statewide standard. It was a class in civics. That was it, and all the districts had their own thing. And so kids who were in Detroit were taught different standards than kids in the richer districts. And so what, what good is that if you want to lift everybody? Anyway, the bottom line is urgency is really important in order to get the change you need from at least the people who are in the position to change. But sometimes you have to, re you just cannot be discouraged by, be by the continual pushback that you will get. Because no matter what, people, think change is hard, so you still got to do it. You know, you're never, you're never really ready. Can I just say one thing, because I know, I, I know, I don't want to leave you with this notion, and I know we're going to take question and answers, but I don't want to leave you with this notion that it's all terrible, um, and that there are things that we can do. And in chapter 10 of the book that Dan and I wrote, we list a, a series of prescriptions from our experience, from our little laboratory of democracy, that's Michigan, of things that worked despite all of the challenges. Now, we're not there yet in Michigan. We have not arrived. Uh, the unemployment rate in Michigan is now 9%, um, but it was 11.5. In California, you, you're on a, I mean, you guys surpassed us. We went below you in terms of unemployment rate. You it was 14, excuse me. It was 14.5. 14 14 I don't even like to say it. Yeah. Um, but so we've, we, you know, we, it really, what, what happened? Hey, Jen, can I, can I come back to... Um, they want to know the answer. I know. I know, but they, but they, but they have the answer. So, so I want to come back for a minute. You'll... you'll we'll, we'll... Hang on the edge of your chair. What you say? For the answer. Got to learn to get along. 25 years. 25 years. Do you love me? <laughs> yes, I love you. So, um, okay, so you have a burning platform, you have a sense of urgency, and I want to ask them, Jen, why don't we have a sense of urgency about this? Why don't we have the Hu Jintao, I got to create 25 million jobs? I, 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 this is a political question in a political season. I mean, do you feel like there's a national sense of urgency about the economy? No. They aren't and, even talking about it anymore. Yes, ma'am. It's because the legislators get paid anyway. Oh, that's interesting. And they're holding, on, they're holding on to their job. So lots of that happens, right? People at the newspaper companies held on to their jobs. And in the trains, they held on to their jobs. And Blockbuster, they held on to their jobs and didn't see. If we don't do something different, things are going to be bad. But, who, but we have to generate that sense of urgency, you know, with Congress, I think. I mean, I agree with you. There is that sense. Yes, ma'am. Do you want to jump on that one? Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, the, the tax code has been crafted by lobbyists hired by Maybe those you companies. Maybe should repeat her point um, the question, for, for over here, she said, because those who are elected are um, elected by the big corporations and others who are doing business in other countries. 
and they take advantage of the, not just the labor arbitrage, but the lower, you know, if they have a capital gains tax rates that, that's 15%, and everybody assumes that, that that extra money that they get from having a 15% capital gains tax rate, this is all investors, that that will be invested to create jobs. That's what all the, all the, all the uh, politicians say, right? You have a lower tax rate, you're gonna invest that money to create jobs, right? Well, where are those multinational companies creating those jobs? Somewhere else. Somewhere else. There's, no, there's nothing that ties that lower tax rate. Shh, shh, shh. There's nothing that ties that lower tax rate to investment in the United States. We have to shape our tax policy to ensure the outcomes that we are seeking. So if you're going to get a lower rate, tie that benefit to job creation here. And don't just assume that people are going to invest here because they're going to invest where they're going to maximize their income, their return, and that's going to be Breathe. somewhere else. Okay. Breathe. Sorry. Okay, so. So I, I want to make one more point in the leadership context and then cut my bride loose to um, keep doing what she's doing, which is, um, which is that what you need is you need a shared vision, right? There has to be a shared picture of where we're going, uh, a place that we want to get to, the way things work, and then strategies to get there. And we're missing that in this country because we have two profoundly different visions of how it works. And one vision is really um, the vision that works for individual corporations, and that's a classic free market view, uh, Ron Paul being the greatest champion of it, Romney certainly having worked in that field to a great degree. And that belief is get government out of the way you know, cut tax rates, including for the rich, have them invest and jobs will grow. This is the basic idea. And, and I think that idea is just broken in my It worked view. in the 19th century. It worked in the 20th century. 21st century, it ain't gonna work. Right, I mean, this is the fundamental point we're making, two points. One is that money is gonna flow to the most efficient place. And you, we don't need to condemn Walmart because as Robert Reich would say, we like the cheap products, and if somebody has more expensive products but makes them in the US, we're still going to Walmart. We like them as investors. We like to see our pension fund grow, right? Our 401k grow. And if the company is not growing it, then our 401k pension manager is gonna say, I don't want that company. And so the companies have enormous pressure to cut costs, to be efficient, to use technology, eliminating jobs, and to move jobs abroad. Do you guys agree with that? Okay, so that's the basic number one. And then number two is the point that Jennifer makes and will allow us to pivot into some constructive strategies, because I know you want to talk about that. And that's the point she's alluded to, is that other, other governments are in the game. So one of my law students this week, who's from Denmark, sends me, um, with great excitement, the new energy policy in Denmark that calls for 40% uh, non-renewables by 2020. Non Half of those are wind. Was it renewables. sooner than that? Not non-renewables, renewables. Renewables <laughs> by, by 2020. And all kinds of alternative energy, which is not only making them independent of foreign oil, but also uh, fostering all kinds of creativity, uh, beneficial impacts for the environment, et cetera. Um, but the point is, these countries are competing. And for us to keep saying, it's a free market, let the free market work, and not think, okay, well, let's make the free market a fair market and really agitate in such a way that we're not going to deal with countries that are dumping pollutants into the air and into the water in ways that we won't allow companies to, that we're not going to allow people to have child labor laws or suicide rates and 70, 90, 120 hour work weeks, that we're going to fight for a fair humanly fair and decent kind of platform for economics. And that should be, we believe, the discussion about the future is how do you find the right balance? How does government do some things well? And my last point, and then you can go, is I, I remember Jennifer being on a show with Steve Wynn. You know, he is Wynn Casinos. And they were on a talk show together. And, and they were like, if you think we're squabbling up here, they, they looked like they were, oh, if, if they'd give, this been given is a not stick. To believe me, compared to. Anyway, Steve Wynn says government has never created a job in its life. Get government out of here, right? Now, 
That's, of course, patently wrong. Uh, you know, where's Tomas, who works for FEMA? That's a government-created job. The investors are the taxpayers. Uh, they pay him to help people when there are disasters that strike. It is literally a government-created job. Every teacher is a government-created job. The money comes by people who willingly give it because they're in a democratic system, just like shareholders willingly buy stock in a company because they want to invest in that company. Not to mention the fact that all of our advantages in so much of technology come from investments that the government made in the internet, in defense technology. So, and, and the most fundamental resource of all is the human resource. And education, wherever that gentleman was who said that that's the first prescription, education is our most essential natural ingredient. We're fighting China right now over precious metals along with Japan and Western Europe. We're fighting China because they've got policies that are keeping precious metals within their boundaries and not allowing them to be traded freely. We should do that. But the most important natural resource is human beings. And we've got to invest in those human beings. And there's a profound role for government there. So there are some important prescriptions. And you want to share a few, and I know Pretty soon you're going to come up. Come on up. Q While you're walking up, let me just say that um, I think the, the takeaway that is important here is that government cannot be passive. There has to be an active strategy. Every single state can do this, but a state even as big as California cannot compete against China. There has to be a national strategy for economic development. What we did in Michigan was we did a SWOT analysis on our state, identified our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats based upon our geography and our history. We identified six sectors that we knew we could compete with, not just against Ohio, but against India. Those six sectors are sectors that we developed strategies, state strategies around to be able to be successful. One of the sectors, for example, was electric vehicle batteries. And when the federal government decided that it was going to invest in making batteries in the United States, we said we're going to put everything we have into making those battery plants come to Michigan. And as a result, because of that, that active government, we had 18 battery companies now coming to Michigan, making, creating 62,000 jobs. Just that one strategy. My point is, our point is, there are specific active steps that a government can take in order to have, to partner, not just with the state, but the federal government, to partner to be able to be competitive. And right now, hands off, aim working. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. I don't know about you, I could go on for a few hours, but they probably would kick us out. Uh, I'm Elaine Petricelli from Book Passage, and I'm so glad you're here tonight. Woo! Uh, before I get to the questions, I just want to say that we want to see you on April 11th when Anne Lamott and her son Sam wow, did, cool. uh, discuss some assembly required. I have a question in here about people having babies when they're very young. Sam, as you know, is uh, quite young, and Annie is grandma, so they're going to talk about that. And on the 25th of April, our One Book, One Marin celebration with Michael Dake, the Lucas, his book, The Oracle of Istanbul, in conversation here with KQED's Michael Krasny. Now, I don't think you've said enough about the War Room, so I want to tell everybody that uh, I love that program. And thank you so much for that. I love, what I love is you're very polite, but um, you don't let them go away until they've answered the question. And I really, really oh, appreciate you. that. Current TV, 6 o'clock Pacific time, 6 to 7, every night. Right. For all you political junkies, if you're a political right. junkie. Channel 107 here. Channel and 107. rebroadcast at 9 o'clock. Rebroadcast at 9 o'clock. Yeah. yeah. So you can watch Rachel one of those hours and Governor Granholm the other one. You pick. <laughs> right. Do, do both. Um, I have so many questions, I don't know where to start. But one of the first ones was, as we talked about economics, Germany seems to be in a very good economic st state. I have four questions that say, what could we learn from Germany? Let me just, one of the most important things to learn from Germany is what they're doing with their labor policy and their apprenticeship programs. They really have it down. They have a system called Kuserbeit, and that means that 
they work with government not to lay people off during tough times, but to downscale their hours and keep them employed. So in other words, Germany, Germany subsidizes employment rather than subsidizing unemployment so that people stay, stay employed, but the government contributes to keeping their salary whole and helps the companies get through very, very tough times. They also have very serious focus on hands-on training from schools. I mean, I, with, with due respect, um, to those who think that we shouldn't be doing, we shouldn't be doing necessarily traditional manufacturing because that's gone, but advanced manufacturing you absolutely have to do as a nation. You have to be able to make at least sophisticated products because if you don't, then you lose your, your strength as a country. Who's going to be making all of the means for our national defense if nothing else? Germany has got this down to a science where they really encourage kids to be able to be more hands-on on the advanced manufacturing processes. They take them in early. They've got this, the system so that they can go in in high school, go through the college or certi technical certification and are placed with a company and then are staying with that company through their life. It's a very, very strong system and we can learn a lot from that. Thank you. Jen, will you say one more word just about, we haven't talked at all about alternative energy and the potential growth in jobs in that field. And we were producing solar panels a lot that were being sold to Germany. Well, California knows that more than anybody. Yeah, I mean, you know, Germany, uh, as many of you know, because California is so advanced in their, in, you, you know, you obviously are leading the country in terms of energy policy. But without a national energy policy, it's difficult because the employers here are not able to sell to the rest of the country. And so without, and Germany has, a, you know, has had a national policy of known as feed-in tariffs where they reward people for being energy entrepreneurs and installing solar panels. It's called distributed de generation on their rooftops and all of the solar companies in Michigan, and I'm sure the ones in California, were selling to Germany because they had policy there that created that. Now, more people are working in renewable energy in Germany than in the German automotive industry, which is a very vaunted industry. They saw that as an opportunity to obviously heal the planet, but to create jobs for their people. Thank you. Um, several of the questions ask about money in politics. Uh, there's one poignant question that says, I just don't feel my vote, vote counts anymore. It's the people with money. Who are, whose votes are counting. How can we cure this? How can we get back to the point where the citizens are uh, talking to the politicians and uh, the leaders are listening to the citizens instead of certain people? Policy, okay, so we need a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United, which is the Supreme Court case, right? Um, there are, there are many people who think that we can do this without a constitutional amendment. I just don't think we can. Because if you do it through Congress, which is a question about it anyway, because they're not going to do anything. But um, if you do it through Congress, then there will be loopholes like you saw in McCain-Feingold. They'll find ways around. There must be an amendment to our Constitution saying that corporations are not people and that money cannot be given in an unlimited fashion. Right? So, but let me just say, that um, this has to be done in the first year of President Obama's second term, and I'm, I firmly believe that he will be, and this is my partisan hat showing, but, I, but this has to be done right away when he's reelected. It's because it's going to be done through not Congress, that's one way to amend the Constitution, but the other way is to do it through constitutional conventions across the country. And if you've got an, a campaign apparatus already in place, you can do this. But if you let any time go by, then people will forget about it. And at the next election, we'll be all be saying, why didn't we do something about it? So there does need to be a constitutional amendment. I, I just want to um, address the issue from another standpoint. I totally agree with Jennifer. I, I just taught that case to my law students, the Citizens United case. And it's just, it's absolutely crazy, that case that the Supreme Court gets itself in a total knot about how upset they are that corporations aren't able to speak freely. <laughs> now, in the very same opinion, they say that 24, million, 24 people were responsible for spending $126 million in the last election cycle, in the 08 cycle. And Yet they had this problem that they felt like corporations need to be able to speak. And they said there are 
five million, I think, corporations, 5,000, a big number of corporations. It was only like 5,000, I think, that had earnings of less than a million dollars. And these people shouldn't have to set up PACs. They shouldn't have to register because it's so difficult. They should be able to just spend their corporate money. And I mean, what they're talking about are people who, probably people in this audience who have an LLC or a company that earns a million dollars, and it might be theirs, or they might have a couple partners, but they're making income that they're totally free to spend as citizens and to contribute to campaigns, just like every other poor person. So it was an absolutely terrible case, but they have now carved out an absolutely horrible position. Um, and I suppose you could have a new Supreme Court that would now reverse the five. They reversed six cases or so to do that, their own Supreme Court precedents to do that. So I suppose you could have another court come in and reverse again, but it's terrible well, law. Well, you need a bunch of new people on the court, though. Too. Right, right. Okay. But, which would be good. But, <laughs> but here's the other thing I want to say to the, to the gravitas of the question. Our, our districts are terrible in terms of Congress. But the fact is, there's about... I don't know, I'm, I'm, this is not a fact but a generalization, of about 20% of the districts could be won by Republicans or Democrats. And so how moderate their position is, is very, very important in those perhaps 40 or 60 of 435 races. And that's true of California politics as well. You're going to find state assembly seats that are fairly small and are really important. And, you know, at one level I say, shame on us in the internet world, right? I, you don't need to pay for postcards. I mean, but it's, it's totally free. Don't to let it discourage you from voting, though. I mean, it, that, really, that's, It's exactly the point I'm making, I know. though, is I just A, to vote, and B, that you can move people in districts, and that you can let people know that you're irate, not just about things you can't control, but about yeah. who's running in this race and who's a more moderate Republican. Because right now, we are completely hamstrung by people who've taken you know, these pledges with the right wing and who, even when Boehner wanted to compromise, he had so many people to the far right, he couldn't do anything. So you know, we need to be involved in those races and say, give us radical compromisers, not radical lefties. Uh, but radical compromisers who are willing to stand up and say, um, I'm willing to cut a loaf. I'm not willing to cut a baby, but I'm willing to cut a loaf and, and negotiate some things. <laughs> Let's take one more question. Uh, and this is a, a big one. In this age of unreliable sources of media, excluding current TV and the war room, um, we, there is so much bias information we hear people saying things that are so outrageous that they have heard on certain media outlets. How do we call them on the l absolute lies that happen? Um, so is there a specific there? Uh, a one person, person mentioned Fox News. Everybody else was really nice and didn't mention anybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I, 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 this is, um, it's a really, it's tough because of course First Amendment allows people to speak the way they want. There are great, you know, poly fact, you know, politifact, fact checkers, et cetera, that are out there. I'd encourage you all to watch my show. But I am not balanced either. I'm fair, but I'm You're not fair. balanced. I mean, I, I come from a perspective, but I let people know that I'm coming from a perspective. But that doesn't mean I'm shading the facts. The facts are what the facts are. And that's how you should portray it. Um, I, I don't know how you can call people on it other than, you know, you can do what happened to Rush Limbaugh, mm -hmm. decide to pull advertisers, get them where it counts. You can find a channel that you, you trust, somebody you trust. Um, and I know that's, this is the last question, that was the last question, and I'm just wondering, can we I can just do, do one more? Just, <laughs> let me just do, can I just do a quick shift and then, and then we'll let y'all go, because I know it's, it's late. And the quick shift sort of comes from that last question, which, which is the person who said they felt um, that their voice didn't, wasn't heard. And I just, I want to say to all of you, especially you leadership students out there, um, you know, we really need great people to step up and lead. We need people to run for office, to raise their hand and say, yes, send me. Because it's hard, for the very reason that it's hard. A lot of people say, I don't want to put my toe into the water because it's like piranhas, and why would I want to do that? You have men and women who are serving this country and who are facing a lot worse. This is a form of service to your nation. 
And I think it's really important that people think about how they serve and what they contribute here. You're put on this planet for doing something more than serving yourself. Everybody's doing that. But you're put here to be able to leave this world better than when you arrived. And we need great people in office. So I would encourage you, not just in political office, but in leading in your community, I just encourage you to not backbench life, but to lead. Oh, thank you.